All right, and welcome to chapter seven of physical geography. And we're now done with the atmosphere, thank God, right? Um, and now we're moving on to the next sphere, the biosphere. So we're going to talk today with biogeography as I start. Kind of an appropriate thought. Um, and let's start with this whole idea of exotic invaders. So exotic invaders is not the name of some weird science fiction movie, but it's really just this idea that you know people oftentimes move animals and plants around the world and allow them to move to other parts of the world they never existed in. So if you think about in human history, right, um, I think I've made this comment that the only animal that lives on all seven continents is man and dogs, because we bring them, and rats, unintentionally with the rats, intentionally with the dogs. But there's other ways you can think about this. Um, when Europeans came from Europe to the Americas, they brought with them horses and cows and pigs and wheat. Uh, these were things that had never been there before. Okay, And so these are organisms that probably would not have made it from Europe or Asia to America except for people. And sometimes it's intentional, like we did purposely bring dogs with us, but it can also be unintentional, or bringing the rats with us. And it isn't just animals, it can also be plants or insects as well. But one of the main concerns that we're going to talk about is when this happens, when we basically interfere in the natural action of things, we kind of basically help plants get where they would never go before, or animals is that when you let an animal or a plant enter a new ecosystem where they have never been before and where they've never evolved in connection with the other animals and plants, sometimes they have an unfair advantage. They can basically grow faster than ever because there's nothing to stop them. Uh, they can lead to many extinctions of native species, as we're going to talk about. And why would we do that? Well, in some cases, it's economical. So Hawaii... Right, this island in the middle of the Pacific, humans brought bananas and, and uh, coconuts and what, pineapple and cows. All these were brought to Hawaii for very um, important economical decisions, and there's been some consequences. We're going to talk about, in particular, a, a case here of the Nile perch. Now, the Nile perch is, a, as you can see, large fish. It was not native to Lake Victoria, which is right here in Central Africa. As uh, the name would imply, it lives in the Nile River here further north. But it was uh, brought there to improve fishing in the 1950s um, for food. Now, as you can see, it's a big fish, but there's been some issues. One of the things is it's pretty much the biggest fish in the lake, and it eats whatever it wants, and there was nothing to stop it. So a large amount of native species of fish went extinct. And it also tends to eat a lot of the little small shrimp and crawfish in the water. So it's changed the natural balance of things. A lot of species have gone extinct or changed their way of lives. But there's also been some other disruptions. Um, many of the fishermen that surround the lake were small fishermen feeding just their families. And you need bigger specialized equipment for this. Uh, you need to be commercially fishing. And so they couldn't keep up. They couldn't afford to use the new machinery. And there were less fish, so they went out of business. They had to find other work. Okay. There's also been a lot of ecological disruption, as we talked about with the species of fish in the lake dropping. But one thing that's also happened is that these fish, when they're caught, to dry them, there's no refrigeration, so they have to build a fire and basically smoke the fish. Previously, the fish they caught before the Nile perch, very small, they would just lie them out in sheets to dry in the sun. This fish too big, you have to smoke it. So they cut down all the firewood near the lake to smoke the fish. But in doing so, as you can see, basically took away all the ground cover. And it's led to a lot of increased erosion and degradation of the soil nearby. And that's had some issues as well. Even the shorelines now have an effect. All this runoff from the decreased forest cover. So sometimes these actions have a much wider consequence. And we're going to talk about how all these things can interplay. So the first thing is the patterns. And they call these biogeographic patterns. In other words, why do things live where they do? Right? And why do we study this more importantly? Well, it lets us look at the way Earth works with another lens. It gives us a better understanding. If we know that a certain bird needs these type of features to occur and we know that they're in that area, right? it helps us explore things. It gives us a better understanding because as we're going to talk about with, with physical geography, right? it's this 
interaction of humans and the natural systems, and that's just one of them. Also very closely related to ecology. So ecology is the science of studying basically the connections of life. So biology would study life, maybe look at cellular reproduction or a plant or an animal, but ecology looks at how do these animals interact in the wild or in that. So one of the things we look at, one of the patterns is biodiversity. And you've probably heard this term, they're very biodiverse regions. If you go into any area, let's just say you went into the Cook County Forest Preserve or Illinois State Park, and you counted and looked at all the plants and animals and how many different numbers of species, how many different types of trees or birds or squirrels are there and counted them up. The higher the amount, the higher the biodiversity. Some areas might not have much, some might have more, okay? And by the way, just so we're on the same term, species, the term species is usually defined as a group of animals or plants or whatever that interact with each other naturally. In other words, we don't help it, they happen. And when they interact, they can breed or mate, and that mating produces offspring that are fertile. In other words, it's kind of a self-sustaining population, okay? So a human and a chimpanzee are not of the same species because even though we interact, as far as we know, and heaven forbid, they don't produce viable offspring, okay? A dog and a fox can breed. It's kind of weird. It's kind of complicated. They're not usually don't interact. So we'll talk about this more and more, but generally species, right type of animal. And one pattern that we notice, and you'll see that I'm kind of going over the next slide right here, is that biodiversity is strongest near the equator in the tropics. So here we're looking at basically land I'm sorry, the um, amount of plant species on land. And the darker the purple and red, the more there are. And you can see here that in Indonesia and southern China, in southern Mexico, in the tropical rainforest here, the highest numbers. The further north you get, or the further south you get, it tends to drop. Okay? And that's a pattern that we see, and call it latitudinal, because we're talking about latitude being the difference, north or south. Another thing we see is island biodiversity. Now, when we think island, it's not just, you know, a cute little place surrounded by water. An island is any area that is surrounded by an habitat that you can't live in. So, for instance, if you are a uh, an insect and you need to have grass to live on, and if you have a little patch of grass that is surrounded by a huge parking lot, that grass is an island, right? The parking lot is inhospitable. So this could be an area in the middle of a desert that has an oasis or a spring of fresh water where the plants grow, surrounded by thousands of miles of harsh desert. That's an island as well. And it can also be an area of land surrounded by water. Okay? So island is just this area of life in a sense. And one thing we notice, another pattern, just like we notice that biodiversity is most is highest in the tropics, is that the larger the island, the higher the biodiversity. The smaller, the less. So here's an example of the Caribbean, right? We've got all these islands, uh, Cuba, Jamaica, all these different islands, different sizes. And what we notice is that as the square mileage of the island increases, so we'll start with Odonia right here, tiny little Odonia, all the way up to Hispaniola and Cuba. Generally speaking, if you plot the trend that the number of different species of animals and plants increases with the size of the island, okay? So you can see right here, these three islands, Saba, Redonia, Montserrat, very similar in size and have a very similar low amount. Then you move to the middle of sizes of Jamaica and Puerto Rico all the way up to Hispaniola and Cuba, which have the highest amounts. Another thing that can change it is the animals moving themselves. Animals migrate. So you've all seen birds flying north you know, in the fall and coming back south in the spring. So there are areas where there's very few animals during the winter, but during the summer, the amount of animals increases, okay? And so a lot of animals migrate. They can migrate latitudinally, moving north or south or east or west, like we talk about, but they can also migrate altitudinally. Some animals in the winter live in the lowlands, in the summer go up the mountain, so they kind of follow the mountain up and down. But these are due to this idea of push and pull. So why do birds fly south in the winter? It's because the area they eat in has less resources, less food. 
So can Canadian geese in the summer live in the far north of, of Canada and Alaska. Lots of plants in the summer. But when the winter comes and it's covered with snow, there's less plants. They fly south where there's more food. So they're being pushed by dropping resources, right? And in the summer, they're pulled north because there's a lot more food there, right? And animals, we track this. Because one of the reasons we track the movement of animals is so why do they move? So what are they, what are they looking for? What, what would cause them to move? Because migration is a very stressful thing. In a perfect world, you get to stay where you are. You know, just like, you know, in a perfect world for us, we could sit on the couch, you know, and eat Twinkies and watch movies. But, you know, we have to actually go to work and, you know, go to school. So we have to migrate in a sense that way. And so animals are tracked for that one reason. Here's an example, the monarch butterfly, right? And this is actually a tiny little sticker that's placed on them. It doesn't hurt them. But it has some information so that if someone finds it, they can call it in. And we can track where it was last seen. And we know they migrate. So they spend the winter here in central Mexico. And in the summer, they fly north. Okay? So over here is where they are in the summer, the blue. In the spring, they're right here. They go back and forth. And so one of the ways we track these is why. And what we find is that they are following milkweed. It's a plant that they eat. In fact, they eat only milkweed. So they move as far north as the milkweed grows. There's no milkweed right here for the most part because it's the high mountains. And then they move back as the winter comes and the plant dies off. They stay away from the snow. They go back and forth. And so tracking them let us follow that. Another example right here is the Canadian geese. Among many other migratory birds, a lot of birds fly north in America in the summer because up here in the far north, during the summer, there is a lot of plants. It's 24 hours of sun, plants go crazy, but in the winter they fly south. And one thing we've noticed, tracking them, this one is a little like radio responder on its back, is that a lot of birds follow rivers and lakes. And that this area right here, the Mississippi River, tends to be like a bird highway. The birds follow it because of the water and the plants at the river's edge for food. And so all these kind of basically bird highways converge right through here in the middle of the United States. Another pattern that we can map is evolution. And I'm going to stop here because that's a whole other topic and I need to have myself a stretched out the silliest break. Stretch out the silliest.